This is the Linear Algebra Lectures video series. You can find more information about this video as well as a link to the written textbook in the description below. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about this video series and the associated teaching and learning tools I've created for it. Lecture 22, Properties of Matrix Multiplication. Our objectives for this lecture are to understand the associative, distributive, compatibility, and identity properties of matrix multiplication, compute the power of a square matrix, compute the transpose of a matrix and understand its algebraic properties, and to understand the left and right side inverse theorems. Recall our definition of matrix multiplication that we talked about in the previous lecture. When we have an m by n matrix A and an n by p matrix B, we can multiply A times B, and the result is the matrix whose columns are the result of multiplying A by each individual column of B. And we define it in this way so that we get the identity that AB times any vector x is equal to A times the vector Bx. Now this multiplication has some nice algebraic properties, and we've seen some of these properties before. We've got associativity, distributivity, compatibility, and a multiplicative identity matrix that we've talked about previously. Now we can prove these theorems using the definition of matrix multiplication and the algebraic properties that we've talked about previously. Let's walk through the proof of associativity, but all these proofs are pretty similar to what we're about to see. So if we've got three matrices, A, B, and C, defined so that the products a, B, C, and A, B, C are defined. And again, this just means that for each pair of matrices, in order to multiply them, the number of columns of the first matrix has to match the number of rows of the second matrix. So what do we get when we multiply A times B, C? Well, when we multiply B times C, we get the matrix whose columns are B times C1, B times C2, and so on, where the little c's are the columns of the matrix capital C. Now when we multiply A by that matrix, we get the matrix whose columns are the result of multiplying A by each of those individual columns. And then we can use our algebraic property of matrix multiplication to shift those parentheses so that A times BC1 is AB times C1, and so on. But now what we have is the matrix AB multiplied by each individual column of C, and that's the definition of AB times C. So that proves associativity, and like I said, the proofs of the other properties are pretty similar to what we just saw. It's important to notice that what's missing from the list of properties that we just saw is commutativity. In general, it's not true that a times b equals b times a. And this is for a few reasons. If we have an m by n matrix and an n by p matrix, we can multiply a times b. But if m and p are not the same number, then we can't multiply b times a. We can't multiply those matrices in the other order unless those two numbers are equal. But even if they are equal, if m and n are different numbers, then ab and ba will both be defined, but they will be different sizes. ab would be m by m, but ba would be n by n. And if m and n are different numbers, those can't be the same matrix because they're not even the same size. But even when ab and ba are both defined and both have the same size, they still aren't necessarily equal to each other. Here's an example. Here we have a 3 by 3 matrix A and a 3 by 3 matrix B, so both AB and BA are defined, and both AB and BA are 3 by 3, but as you can see here, AB and BA are different. Now there's more algebraic properties that don't work for matrix multiplication. For example, we can't cancel. If we happen to have three matrices A, B, and C, where AB equaled AC, our intuition from algebra classes that we've taken previously might lead us to think that we could cancel the a's from both sides, but we can't. We can't necessarily conclude that b would equal c there. Another algebraic property that we're used to using is that if we have two things multiplied together equaling zero, then one of those two things has to be zero, but that's also not true for matrices. If a b equals o, if a times b equals the zero matrix, then we can't conclude that either a equals o or b equals o. So we have to be more careful now with this new matrix multiplication operation because we now suddenly can't use all of our algebraic intuition to work with multiplying matrices together. So just something that we always have to keep in mind that matrix multiplication is not commutative. Now when we have a square matrix A, we can multiply A by itself. So if A is n by n, we can multiply A by A and get another n by n matrix. So we can multiply a by itself multiple times, and we call this taking the power of a matrix. So a to the k is just a multiplied by itself k times. And just by definition, a to the zero power is going to be the n by n identity matrix. Multiplying matrices by themselves and raising matrices to high powers is something that we're gonna talk about more later in the course and talk about how to do that efficiently. So let's look through a quick example here. We've got a two by two matrix a, negative one, two, three, zero, and we're asked to compute a cubed. So this means a multiplied by itself three times. 
But before we can multiply a by itself three times, we've got to multiply a by itself once. So what's a times a? Well, using our normal process of going across the rows of the first matrix and down the columns of the second matrix, or use technology if you'd like, we get the matrix 7, negative 2, negative 3, 6. So that's a squared. What's a cubed? Well, a cubed is just a squared times a. That's just a times a times a. So we've already computed a squared. We multiply a squared by a, and we get the matrix negative 13, 14, 21, negative 6. But keep in mind, we could have multiplied a by a squared in the other order, and we still get the same result. So when we say that matrix multiplication is not commutative, that doesn't mean that it's never commutative. It just means that it's not guaranteed to work. So sometimes when we multiply two matrices in either order, we get the same result, just not always. Another operation we can do on matrices is transpose. So when we transpose a matrix, we write a with a little t there. So a t is the n by m matrix. So notice that the sizes of the matrix switches. So a was m by n, and a t, a transpose, is n by m. So what we do is we take the rows of our matrix and transform those into the columns of a transpose. So here we can see the two rows of a become the two columns of a transpose, keeping the numbers in the same order. We could also think of taking the columns of a and changing those into the rows of a transpose. We get the same result. Now transpose has some nice algebraic properties. If we transpose a transpose, we just get back to the same matrix that we started with. If we add two matrices and then transpose them, that's the same as transposing the matrices and then adding. If we have a scalar that we want to multiply by our matrix, we can do that either before or after we do the transpose. And then we have this final property where we see how transpose interacts with matrix multiplication. And this may seem strange to you because it says that AB transpose is B transpose A transpose. And you might be wondering to yourself, why isn't that A transpose B transpose? Well, let's first think about why it can't be A transpose B transpose. Because for A, B to even be defined, A would have to be M by N, B would have to be N by P, and notice that those inside numbers match. A transpose is N by M, so those numbers switch. B transpose is P by N, again, those numbers switch. And M and P don't necessarily have to be equal to each other. So A transpose times B transpose might not even be defined in general. But B transpose A transpose will be defined because the number of columns of the first matrix, that's B transpose, is N, and that matches the number of rows of the second matrix, A transpose, which is also N. All right, let's see this in action. What if we have A, B here? A is the matrix 1, negative 1, 2, 0, and B is the matrix negative 2, 0, 3, 1, negative 1, 0. Let's compute A, B transpose and B transpose A transpose and show that they're equal. So first we'll compute a, b transpose. To do that, we have to first multiply a times b, so we get that here. And then to form a, b transpose, we take the rows of a, b and turn those into the columns of a, b transpose. Next, we'll compute b transpose a transpose. So first we form a transpose and b transpose separately, again, taking the rows of a and turning those into the columns of a transpose, and taking the rows of b and turning those into the columns of b transpose. Notice that a transpose times b transpose is not defined here, so again, a, B transpose can't possibly be always equal to A transpose, B transpose. So we multiply B transpose, A transpose, and we get the same matrix that we got when we computed A, B transpose. So this just illustrates that that property works as we said. Now, if you want to compute transpose using your technology, you can do so easily on the TI-84. You find transpose under number two on the math submenu. It's that little T. Notice that you have to type your matrix first, so you have to type your matrix from the names menu and then go into the math menu and put in the transpose symbol. If you want to use Wolfram, the command is easy, it's just the word transpose. Don't forget to use a capital T and those square brackets. We can also compute matrix powers using our technology. On the calculator, we can just use the regular exponent symbol. We can't use the exponent symbol in Wolfram, however. In this example, we've got a 3 by 3 matrix B. If I try to type B squared, what's happening is that it's just squaring each individual entry of the matrix B, which is not what we want. Instead, I have to write B dot B. Remember that the period symbol is what we use to multiply matrices in Wolfram. I can also use the matrix power command, which is convenient when we want to compute high powers of our matrix. So in this case, I'm still computing the same B squared, but we can see the efficiency of the matrix power command in the next example. So here I've computed a random matrix, a 10 by 10 matrix containing random numbers between negative 10 and positive 10, and I'm multiplying m to the 40th in two different ways. The first way I'm doing it is just writing m dot m dot m dot m 40 times, and then the second way is using the matrix power command. 
And the timing command that you see here is just asking how long did it take the computer to compute these results. And notice that the matrix power command is much faster. It's about almost five times faster than just multiplying the matrices individually. This is because of some efficiencies that we're gonna learn about later in this course. So just whetting your appetite a little bit for something that we're gonna learn about a little bit later on. Now, we've talked about how to add, subtract, and multiply matrices. What about division? How can we think about what it would mean to divide a matrix by another matrix? Well, in algebra, we typically think of division in terms of multiplication and multiplicative inverses. So for example, if we think of the real number three, dividing by three is the same as multiplying by one third. So when we think about matrix division, we wanna think about is there a matrix that when we multiply by it, cancels out the matrix that we were talking about. So to divide by A, we would need a matrix B for which A times B equals the identity matrix or for which B times A equals the identity matrix. Or maybe both. Remember that matrix multiplication is not commutative. So you could imagine a situation where A times B equals the identity, but B times A doesn't. We're going to be talking about these inverses more in the next lecture. But for right now, let's talk about what we're going to call the left side and right side inverse theorems. So the left side inverse theorem tells us what happens when we have an M by N matrix A and an N by M matrix C for which CA equals I. What does that tell us about A? Can that just happen for any matrix A or does that tell us something specific about this special matrix A? Well, it turns out that if that happens, if that matrix C exists, then A must have a pivot in every column and A can't have more columns than rows. Let's focus on that last conclusion. Why would it be that if we knew that our matrix has a pivot in every column, that that means that our matrix can't have more columns than rows? Well, remember that if we had a pivot in every column, each of those pivots also has to be in its own row. So if we had a pivot in every column, we can't have more columns than rows because a matrix with more columns than rows would be wider than it is tall, and there wouldn't be enough rows for us to have a pivot in every column. And so in this case, just knowing that we have a pivot in every column means that we can't have more columns than rows. Okay, what about the rest of the theorem? So we know that we have this matrix C for which C times A equals I. And we wanna to try to prove that we have a pivot in every column. This should remind you of the linearly independent columns theorem. And one of the statements of the linearly independent columns theorem talks about the matrix having a pivot in every column. It also talks about the solutions of the homogeneous equation AX equals zero. So let's let U, the vector U, be a solution of the equation AX equals the zero vector. Well, what that means is that A times U equals the zero vector. That's what that word solution means. But now how do we bring C into the picture? Well, if I multiply both sides by C, I get C times AU equals C times the zero vector, and any matrix times the zero vector is going to equal the zero vector. But by the way we defined matrix multiplication, I can shift those parentheses and write that as CA times U, and CA is the identity matrix, so that's I times U, which is U. So we have both C times AU equaling the zero vector, and also C times AU equaling the vector U, so that means that U has to equal zero. But all we knew about the vector U was that it was a solution of AX equals zero, and we concluded that U had to equal zero. So that means that the zero vector is the only solution of AX equals zero, and so as we said before, the linearly independent columns theorem kicks in and tells us that A has a pivot in every column, and we've talked about why that means that our matrix can't have more columns than rows. Now we have a similar right side inverse theorem, which tells us what happens when we have a matrix A, where there's a matrix D for which A times D equals the identity matrix. In this case, we conclude that A has a pivot in every row, and that therefore A can't have more rows than columns. Again, let's focus on that last statement. Why is it that if we had a pivot in every row that we can't have more rows than columns? Well, if we imagine a matrix that had more rows than columns, that's a matrix that's taller than it is wide, well, in a matrix like that, we don't have enough room for all those pivots in every row because we run out of columns. If we have more rows than columns, then we don't have room for a pivot in every row. So that's why if we have a pivot in every row, we can't have more rows than columns. Now let's get into the proof of the theorem. This one should make you think of the spanning columns theorem because one of the statements of the spanning columns theorem tells us that we have a pivot in every row, and that theorem also talks about solutions of the equation AX equals B for any vector B. So let's let B be any vector in RM, and let's consider the equation AX equals B. We want to show that that equation has a solution no matter what B is. And it turns out that if we multiply A times DB, 
Again, by the definition of matrix multiplication, we can shift those parentheses. AD is the identity matrix, and then the identity matrix times any vector B is that same vector B. So that's why A times DB is equal to B. But that means that we can put db in for the x in our equation ax equals b. That means that x equals db is a solution of ax equals b. And this tells us that we have a solution of ax equals b no matter what b is, and then the spanning columns theorem kicks in. That tells us that we have a pivot in every row, and we've talked about why that means that we can't have more rows than columns. So if we have an m by n matrix, if there is a matrix C for which CA equals I, then A has to have a pivot in every column, and that means that A can't have more columns than rows. And if there's a matrix D for which A times D equals I, we have a pivot in every row, which means that we can't have more rows than columns. The only way that we can have a matrix with a pivot in every column and a pivot in every row is if we don't have more columns than rows, and we don't have more rows than columns, that means that the number of rows and columns has to be the same. That means that A would have to be square. And so this is the kind of matrix that we're going to talk about in the next lecture. We're going to call these invertible matrices, and these have a lot of interesting properties that we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about. Thanks for watching this video lecture. You can find links to the other videos in this series and to the written textbook in the description below. If you're an instructor, you can contact me for more information about the over 300 online linear algebra homework problems that I've created for the free MyOpenMath platform.